Welcome to Digication Scholars Conversations. I'm your host, Kelly Driscoll. In this episode, you'll hear part one of my conversation with Elise Hellum, Experiential Learning Program Manager for Research and Technology at the University of Puget Sound. More links and information about today's conversation can be found on Digication's Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Full episodes of Digication Scholars Conversations can be found on YouTube or your favorite podcast app. Welcome to Digication Scholars Conversations. I'm your host, Kelly Driscoll, and today I am so excited to introduce Elise Hellum, Experiential Learning Program Manager for Research and Technology at the University of Puget Sound. Welcome, Elise. Hi, Kelly. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so thrilled to be part of this conversation and to have some time to connect with you and um, have a, a conversation about education and higher ed and reflection and e-portfolios. So. And all of the things, all of the things. I'm so excited to have you here as well. And I thought it would be fun uh, to kick off our conversation today, um, just having our listeners know a little bit more about your background. I actually discovered some things about your background looking at your own personal portfolio. <laughs> Oh, no. um, before we had um, the chance to connect today and um, just love learning about people's backgrounds. And I think our listeners will really enjoy learning about yours and um, maybe some of the um, history you have in teaching and how you made your way to Puget Sound. Yeah, yeah. So I jumped into teaching after graduating from college at um, Westmont University in um Santa Barbara area, California, and I taught high school and middle school math and science. My specialties were chemistry and um, geometry. So I loved all of those re- weird technical areas that folks t- kind of struggle with because I love helping people be able to access information and understand concepts that they thought were inaccessible. But they go, oh, no, actually, I really am capable of knowing this and, and succeeding at, you know, math or science when maybe they, they didn't typically um feel successful in that. So that just as an aside, those are the types of students that I love to work with, right? Like the ones that want to learn but have struggled, right? Um, And so I did uh, K-12 education for about 12 years at different middle schools and high schools and um, really loved engaging with their learning. They're so vibrant. Um, I'm I'm one of the weirdos that really loved my time in middle school. Not me personally, that was awful. But I loved (laughs) teaching middle schoolers because they're in this weird squishy area that they really don't know who they are they're going through lots of changes and and big shifts both um intellectually and physically and emotionally and it it was always my joy to come alongside those students and support them in their journeys like helping them to see where they'll go next so um i started out in k-12 i i really enjoyed that time i loved uh making my classes experiential as much as possible right so um diving into labs, diving into projects. Um, I I did lecture, right, because you sometimes need to do that. But as often as I could, I loved putting students at the, the center of the learning and allowing them to really um, kind of shine um, so that yeah. they could well, learn concepts and then share with their classmates and that they could be the experts in the room. So um, I loved that kind of approach to teaching. And reflection was a real big piece of that. Um, So I can remember being um, sort of a lead teacher at our middle school. And uh, one of the things that I helped to develop was a sort of a portfolio style process where students would look at the different projects that they're doing in all their different classes and they would pick certain elements, certain um, evidence. So this paper or this rough draft or these images or these drawings or those sketches, and they would sort of pull those pieces of evidence together, think about, okay, what did I learn at this point in the project or in this point in the process and sort of tell the story um, of their learning. And so the students would, I mean, I don't know if you've ever had this experience. Students would grumble a little, right? They'd be like, why? Why do we have to do this? We already did the work. <laughs> uh, why do we have to think about why we did the work? This feels so weird, right? But that metacognition is so important. Um, and I as a result of the work that they did and the reflection that they did, um, we hosted sort of a a little symposium celebration at the end of the year. And um, we would have all of our, in the middle school, all of our eighth graders, right? So all of our soon to be high school students, our graduating students, um, give a presentation and they'd have to look at the evidence that they collected in their sort of digital portfolios um, and pick one or two 
pieces that they wanted to share and say like, these are, this is what I learned. This is what I'm really excited about. Um, we gave them some structure about like things that they had to mention, but then as far as how they shared their learning, they got to pick, right? So I, I had students who made slideshows. I had students who made videos. I had one student who literally wrote a song and like sang about their experience. And so it was so cool to see them, you know, take that, the academic work, the reflective work, and then turn it into like a showcase piece and an experience that they shared with their classmates and their, and their, and their parents. Um, and so that's, that's sort of the world that I came in. And I reached a point where I was sort of looking at what my next step would be. And I had a friend um, who works uh, as a professor at Sacramento State University in California. And she's like, you know, have you ever considered higher education? And I said, no. <laughs> Why would I go with my head? I love middle schoolers. I love high schoolers. I love all, them in all their weird ways. And she said, no, you know what? You have some skills that would really be relevant in higher education, um, that deep pedagogy. Like I love, um, I love teaching. I love really helping students succeed. And she's like, that is a skill set that we need in higher ed. So maybe explore some options. And so I, I ended up taking her advice. Um, and I found a position at the University of Puget Sound up here in Tacoma, Washington, um, that was around, that was uh, nested in experiential learning, right? So kind of, again, that application of your your learning in real world context, that kind of project-based piece that I was really familiar with felt really natural connection to experiential learning. Um, but it was around ePortfolios and documenting your learning and developing a program for ePortfolios. And so I said, you know what, I feel, I feel like I could do this. This feels like a natural extension of the kind of work that I do just in a different context. Um, so I, I took a, a shot at that, applied for that position. Um, this is my little like hint to anyone who's listening and you've done a little bit of a reach for a position that <laughs> fell out of your your realm. I, I did a little reach and um, the application that I submitted included a video that was like my own reflection of me and my teaching um, on my resume. And that and that resonated with the the folks there that were doing the hiring. And they said, you know what, I, I think that you'll be a good fit. So landed at Puget Sound, been here now about five years, um, working in the Office of Experiential Learning um, along some really amazing colleagues here at the university. And I, I started in ePortfolios and I've kind of acquired some other programs and other pieces, including I helped to run the summer research program. Um, and I work really closely with folks who do internships and study abroad and community-based learning. So um, I'm in a really cool hub of lots of amazing things happening at the university. And I have a lot of opportunities to work with cool folks like my friends at Digication and and the other people that I've met through um, the portfolio world and community. Yeah, well, and it, it just seems like your uh, experiences in the K-12 environment created such a kind of natural transition for you into Puget Sound. And we are always talking um, to other schools that we work with in the ePortfolio community about how Puget Sound is using ePortfolios for experiential learning in many different areas. So I would love for you to, to touch on some of those. Um, I let Elise know that I had pulled up one of their wonderful kind of showcase ePortfolios that features a number of different students that are using ePortfolios and different capacities, um, all connected to experiential learning. Um, that's called Learning Through a Logger's Eyes. And <laughs> we'll be sure to include a link to this wonderful ePortfolio in our show notes for those that want to go and look at it. Um, but it features some students that were doing work with ePortfolios in a experience there known as RISE, mm -hmm. which yep. is the Reflective Immersive Software Experience. Yes. Um, there's Study Abroad, uh, Summer Undergraduate Research. Um, there's a Summer Fellowship Internship Experience. So, um, Elise, any of those that you want to kind of jump in and... Um, speak about specifically um we'd love to learn more about mm -hmm. um but also if there's just something overall about puget sounds kind of a approach to experiential learning and how this may intersect with e-portfolios we'd love to to hear about that too yeah 
That's a big question. So I'm going to unpack a couple of things. So I'll, I'll definitely talk a little bit about ePortfolios and how we use it here at the University of Puget Sound, um, but also about experiential learning. Um, and so maybe I'll start with experiential learning, give you all a little bit of history about the work that we've been doing here. So experiential learning as, as an office, as a sort of initiative, I guess, um, formally began around six or seven years ago. Um, although experiential learning efforts around internships and community-based learning and applying learning in real world contexts and definitely summer research, those actually predate my office that I'm in. But um, Renee Houston, um, who was actually the the Associate Dean of Experiential Learning, and she hired me to to take on the ePortfolio um, program manager role. She um, worked to secure a grant um, around experiential learning, and it was really aimed at creating accessible opportunities for students to take internships in um, what are typically inaccessible areas um, like uh, nonprofit work and governmental-based work, because often those internships don't come with like a paycheck, right? So often they're right. unpaid internships. So students who might be really interested in those mission-based internship opportunities um, sometimes didn't have the ability to go and undertake those internships because maybe they had to earn a wage. Um, they had to take a summer job. And so um, born out of sort of her interest to, to make internships in a variety of ways um, accessible to students. Um, we applied. They applied for a grant, and they sort of launched the summer fellowship internship program, which was SFI. What you one of the programs that you mentioned, and that was housed within experiential learning. And um, there was a vision that um, Renee had, and and the university had to really grow those opportunities on campus to um, partner with folks who were already doing really meaning experiential learning work um, to kind of. Uh, advance their efforts or to um, cultivate and curate new programs to create opportunities for students to apply their learning. So that happened about, you know, seven or so years ago. Um, and through a succession of grants, um, we've expanded our office. We have new program managers like myself, who um, hosts ePortfolio efforts and also some research and then a couple of other program managers who run like Nicole Kendrick, my colleague, runs the Reflective Immersive Sophomore Experience um, course. And also she now runs all of our internship based programs um, that come out of our office, including SFI. Um, and so really the the objective has been um, twofold, right? One, to support students in finding and taking advantage of really meaningful opportunities to apply their learning um, and supporting them in their process, both through, you know, navigating all the logistics, but also when they're doing their experience, when they're doing their internship, when they're studying abroad, when they're doing their research, to be able to unpack that learning in real time and do that reflective work that's really valuable. Again, like my middle school students who need to unpack what they're doing and why it's valuable. Um, all of us need to do that at college level and us as adults. Um, college students are adults too, so my apologies. But yes, for everyone, we need to unpack those experiences and understand why we're doing it, what we're learning, and also be able to tell our story as we get ready for the next experience, the next adventure. Um, so that's really been the goal of experiential learning at Puget Sound. And um, through those efforts, through partnerships on campus, through working with faculty who are doing um, this kind of work in their classrooms, um, experiential learning has really become a focus at Puget Sound to the degree that it's become um, a graduation requirement. So all of our incoming students, um, there's a requirement. I actually talk about it in terms of it's a commitment from the university to make sure that every single student has access to experiential learning opportunities of their choice. So we let them, um, we want them to choose from uh, study abroad, undergraduate research, um, summer research specifically, uh, internships, and also community-based learning. Um, and we want them to be able to choose at least one hopefully more than one, but at least one of these experiences um, to be part of their undergraduate experience so that when they leave the university, they're walking out with something on their resume, with some really practical experience that they can tell the story of that showcases what they're able to do. Um, and they're able to sort of tell that story through that reflection that they've done in the experience. They can tell that story to their employer, to the graduate school, to whatever person they want to share that experience with. Um, and share all of the, the things that they've learned and the skills that they've gained. So um, that's a little bit about experiential learning, um, our office, um, and about sort of the the movement that's happening on our campus. Um, what's really cool too about the, the graduation requirement now um, is that it's really um, 
asked faculty to look again at their classes. And many faculty say, hey, I've been doing this. I've been taking my students to conduct research at the, you know, Point Defiance Zoo and Aquarium. They've been doing experiential learning in my classroom. Like, I want to make sure that students know that my class is a part of experiential learning. Um, or, you know, in the English department, they've been hosting writing internships for years as a part of their discipline. And it's been something that they've nudged all their students toward. Um, so, you know, say, hey, students, this is an experiential learning class where you can go and do that work. Or in, you know, French, all the students are required both uh, to, to go study abroad. And so for them to say, hey, we did this, like we've been doing this, our students are engaging in this work. Um, French, by the way, has been doing beautiful e-portfolios with their students to capture their whole um, academic journey. So like we can talk about that more. But um, experiential learning is happening on our campus. So we're celebrating that. And for folks who maybe haven't tried it yet, we're like, hey, we've got resources, we've got opportunities. We want to make sure that you are able to facilitate this with in your classes as well. So we come alongside faculty as they decide to retool their courses. Um, we're hoping to have a workshop this May actually to say, hey, faculty, is this you? Like, let us give you resources, let us give you support so that you can um, integrate these kinds of elements, both reflection and meaningful experiences that take students outside of the traditional classroom. Um, into lots of places in the curriculum. So we're supporting students. Uh, we have financial support for them. We've got structural support for them. And we're trying to support faculty, right, so that they can create similar opportunities um, in their classes. We want it to be something you cannot avoid. It's not like, oh, I have to do experiential learning, which is not typically <laughs> the response I get from students. Uh, they're normally like, yeah, of course I should do that, right? Um, but even students who think, yeah, of course I should do that, Sometimes they need a little nudge, like, okay, so what's your first step to make sure that you take on that internship when you're when you're wanting to do it? What's your first step to, you know, have that conversation with a faculty member that you might want to do research with next summer? Um, because right. sometimes well-meaning students, like they're just so busy, right? So they they need that structure, they need that nudge. Faculty, um, it's good that they're aware of it because they come around the students, they do so much advising and support. So it's really cool that in the time that I've been here, I've seen so much come around faculty, students, staff, all of it, to make sure that there's structures in place for that everyone can be successful in creating and engaging in these kinds of opportunities. So that's been experiential learning. It's been super fun. Um, to be part of that process since it's so, some of it is is really new to us. So, yeah, well, and you're just doing incredible work. And that's so evident when, you know, we're able to see the the impact that these experiences are having on the students through all of the reflections that right. they have created within their e-portfolios. I mean, it just seems like for many of them, they've been these incredibly transformative life changing kinds of experiences and the uh the reflections are very rich okay and i yeah. was curious i don't know if you want to um kind of um speak about one of the programs specifically but i'm curious you know you've got this graduation requirement to have the experiential learning and this reflection component is a, a necessary piece of that. Mm -hmm. So how are you kind of from there leading the students into that kind of thinking or that kind yeah. of process? Because I know, you know, as many of our listeners know, you can't just say like, ready, set, reflect and then right. they're up and going. That so doesn't work. Why does that not work? It sounds like no. it should be that easy, right? Like a magic yeah. wand of reflection. Go. Clearly, like. <laughs> you've got, you know, you've got some kind of process or, mm -hmm. um, you know, development going with the, the faculty and, and they're communicating directly with the students. I would love to know, you know, kind of boots to the ground, how all this is being kind of introduced and maybe continually supported as the students are moving through these experiences. Absolutely. If you saw me jump just there, that was because my cat decided uh, she didn't like oh, what's your cat's <laughs> What's your cat's name? Her Our name is Roxy. Talking. Yeah, we've Roxy. seen a tail. Okay. Yeah, so Roxy is here. <laughs> she normally loves a little attention, but I was trying to nudge her out of the way and she's like, oh no, I'm the star of this no, show. No, she's going to participate. Mm -hmm. So yeah. anyways, 
That's all fine. Hi, Roxy. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now she's hiding. She knows she's in trouble. <laughs> but um, so thinking about how do we support reflection um, on our campus, right? There's there's a lot of work. And actually, I'll say it's been a journey, right? So um, thinking about the seven years of, of experiential learning our office, right? Which again, I want to reiterate that experiential learning was happening at Puget Sound before the office started. But um, we've been really, our aim over the course of time has been to create a culture of reflection on campus, right? That it shows up in lots of places, in lots of instances, and everyone has time and practice um, so that they're able to do it effectively, right? Because as you mentioned, the magic wand of reflection doesn't exist, unfortunately. Um, we can only wish, right? We can only hope. <laughs> but um in in line with all kinds of other teaching pedagogies, right? You got to scaffold things over time, right? So you kind of got to build them over time, give folks a chance to practice, let them try it out in a lot of different ways because people learn differently and people reflect differently and what they're going to like connect with is going to be different, right? Um, so my seniors who are thinking about, you know, graduating and applying for jobs and applying for graduate schools, they're thinking about reflecting on their experiences in, you know, their majors so that they can tell the story to an employer, right? Which is a very different place to be and a different motivation than my first year students who are like, what is going on? <laughs> like, I'm just trying to find their their footing and feel like they're ready to, you know, undertake this whole new adventure and journey that is higher ed with all of its um, known and also hidden curricula, you know. Um, so they're in a very different place reflecting on those experiences and what are they learning and, and how are they navigating things compared to folks that are a little bit later on. So we have tried where possible to um, reach out to our students really early. So um, when I was first hired, one of my roles was to create an opportunity during um, our orientation, um, our passages is what we call it, um, experience where students have as first years where we led a workshop, right? And really the heart of that workshop was around reflection. So we gave them some basic tools. So um, again, I come from K-12. I think simplicity is really important. So you can have really high level critical thinking that is reflective, right? But me, I forget things easy. So I, I want to go with simple tools that I can remember that I can share and that hopefully students can recall <laughs> uh, moving forward. So one of my favorite reflective sort of strategies is just using the phrase, what, so what, now what, right? I so I, I, that was one of the, the methodologies I, I shared during that workshop. I was like, what did you do? Um, why was that important to you? And how does that impact you moving forward? What? So what? Now what? Um, and it was a way, and I've used it for first year students and actually also for seniors for them to unpack their experiences. Because so often they can say the what. What did I do? I did this. I did this. I did this. But then the the deeper level, the thing that really connects others with their story is often nestled in that so what? Okay. Yeah, that's what you did, why does that matter, right? right, right. Um, and that is the space where employers go, this is what you learned and this is what you, how you grew, right? Um, or, you know, when you're working with your faculty members say, this is what you're passionate about. Oh, now I know what you did, but I know why you're passionate about that experience, right? And then once you know those pieces, once you know the so what, you can think about, okay, so what's the next step? So now what, how does this impact the next thing that you wanna do? Um, and the thing I love about that framework is that we've used it in lots of different places. Um, we might even call it some different things. Folks might be familiar with the STAR method, right? The situation, task, action, result, which is For similar, sure. right? Of unpacking your experience and, and thinking about the components. Um, but we use it, you know, in our research program and in our SFI program for students to do that unpacking because sometimes students go through those experiences and they say, you know what? What I learned, what made this important is I realized I hate this. Yeah. I thought I was going to love physical therapy and that is like not my thing, um, you know, but I love pa patient advocacy and I, I'm interested in a different slice, right, of sort of the healthcare industry or people go and do research. They like think that they're going to love research because they want to, you know, go in, into academia and they're like, I had a student who said, you know what, I realized I actually really don't like research, but I loved the dissection piece. Like, I don't want to do any of the data. I don't want to do the analysis, but, but I really dug dissecting my samples. How can I kind of use that to connect to a career that I might be interested in? Um, so I love 
giving them that framework, what, so what, now what? Because sometimes it's a great story of like, happy ending, yay, look what I achieved, right? And sometimes it's, this was really hard, or this was no good, but there's still meaning and there's still value and it can still impact what I want to do next. So one of the things that we do is I, I try to come up with frameworks like that, or I try to identify and find them um, and showcase them and share those resources with students, but also with faculty, right? So if student, if faculty um, come to me because they want to uh, connect with me about ePortfolios, um, we have a conversation before we do anything ePortfolio wise. I say, okay, but why? Why do you want to use this technology? Um, because when you take on a new technology, there's some learning involved, right? Uh, and so the value of the, the end product better outweigh the effort needed to create that end product. Otherwise, no one's going to be happy, right? So they're like, yeah, there was value, but it was so hard and the heart, you know, the difficulty outweighed the value. So we have a conversation about like, why do you want them to, to use an e-portfolio? Why do you want them to do reflection in this way? Um, and then we sort of find ways to break it down over time. Like, so I often say, well, if you want them to be able to have a showcase portfolio, like what you talked about, um, in our, our collection, they better have some preliminary practice with ePortfolio along the way. So for example, in um, in Rise, in the Reflective Immersive Sophomore Experience, um, and also in most of our internship programs, we have the students do field notes um, where they, and they, and they have been historically doing it in their ePortfolios, but sometimes students do it, you know, in a Google Doc, but they practice that reflection. They have prompts, they have sort of, um, uh, frameworks like the what, so what, now what, that we ask them to sort of implement over time so that they're practicing reflection over time. And when they were doing that in their ePortfolio, they were also practicing ePortfolio over time and all of the logistics of ePortfolio. Then at the end, we say, okay, look back at your reflections. We're going to do a summative reflection, right? We're going to do this sort of showcase piece um, in your ePortfolio. So then they had to take their reflective work over time and sort of curate it and also their ePortfolio skill set over time and use it to create a showcase piece. So behind a lot of those portfolios in that collection are often process pieces or process pages where students, it's not as pretty, right? It's not as pretty. It's not as curated. It's not as... Um, articulate, right? Because they had to do those practice pieces, that scaffolding to be able to do that beautiful articulation at the end. Um, so so that's that's another piece is I definitely encourage scaffolding. Um, we come alongside faculty if they if they want to do it. We, we identify how they're, most of them are already scaffolding pieces of it over time. Um, and so that's another piece of the reflection. Um, we've held workshops. Um, we've had guests come in. Um, we've made reflection kind of a, a key talking point. So to the point where um, initially people were like, reflection, that feels really mushy. It's all about your emotions and how do you feel? Uh, they're like, I don't want my students to do reflection. I want them to do critical thinking. And I was like, I think <laughs> we might actually be talking about the same thing, right? Because to reflect on that academic idea and think about how that connects to that real world experience or to think back on that, you know, 101 level class and think about what are the skills that you've pulled into the 201 class, right? That connection, that reflection, that critical thinking, you know, um, is kind of similar. Like that framework is is. And that muscle that you're developing is similar. So um, we've talked about reflection a lot. We've held workshops over time. Um, we've invited faculty who are doing this really well to come and share with their peers, right? So to, to have them, I think that's so valuable to honor the work that's already happening, right? That not everyone's starting at, at stage one, right? Some folks are starting at stage five or stage 10 or stage 50, right? And I'm learning from them, all of them really. <laughs> um, and yeah, so hello. inviting folks who are just a little bit ahead of whoever we're reaching and say, why don't you share? Why don't you tell your story, right? Um, which as we all know, like when you have to teach a skill, um, you develop, you understand that skill better. So when our faculty who are great at reflection teach the skill, um, they're supporting their peers, but they're also supporting themselves because they're now even better able to speak to their students about why that reflection is so important. Um, so uh, over time, when I come across really great resources, I save those. I build um, e-portfolio collections that house resources so that I can say, hey, if you're interested, I point them to that. So um, not always that they have to come to me, but I point them to other things that they can find. We hold workshops. We have conversations. Um, 
I try to have um, showcase or um, examples that I can share, either faculty examples of faculty who are doing things really well or student examples like the collection that you have of students who are doing it really well. Um, and we just try to do it all the time. Um, yeah. Something else that that we do in our office is that we build reflection into our daily work as well. Um, so when we have a team meeting, we almost always open with some sort of reflective prompt or reflective activity um, so that we're exercising that skill for ourselves. Um, and then our students who are on our team go and they take the skills with them into the different spaces that they're on on campus. Um, and then it happens in our gatherings when we meet, when we do several research events. Um, I love to start with a reflection prompt as well. Like um, I have a faculty member that I work with. That's how she takes attendance. I love that she has a reflective prompt every single class period. It's how she takes attendance. And they like choose each other throughout the room. It's amazing. So they're and they can be short or they can be big, but they're just constantly doing reflection. And sometimes yeah. it's about, you know, what's happening in their theater class. And sometimes it's about just life because that also is a part of who we are and what we bring into the classroom. So those are also good reflections to have. Um, so I think our goal has been to create a culture of reflection, um, to create resources, to scaffold it, um, to allow lots of people to practice it all the time. Um, and I will say that that work takes time um, it takes time out of our, our busy, you know, team meetings to do that every time. Sometimes you think it's going to be five minutes and it's more like 15. Um, however, if it's structured well and if the prompts and the ideas are helping you to better know your team and better know their work and better to know what they care about, I think that that reflection is always worth doing, right? Um, it helps me learn something new every time when I'm hearing about what someone else is doing and what they care about. Like that moves me forward and move my work forward. So it does take time, but I think it's valuable and it's an investment that like will pay dividends in the end. So um, that's a little bit about what we do reflection wise um, on our campus. Um, but we definitely, we've built it in everywhere. We've made it a requirement of all the classes who meet the the graduation requirement, like reflection is one of the bullet points in there. They must do regular reflection as a part of the course. So they can't just go do the internship, right? They <laughs> have to <laughs> then reflect on the internship. They can't just go and do research. They have to go and reflect on that research and why it matters and who cares about that really cool protein that you were studying all summer. Like you have to be able to tell that story. Um, and so I think having those structures, those resources, but then also that accountability. Um, in the yeah. curriculum, in our guidelines, in our courses, in our syllabi. I think those things are really important to hold us accountable to doing work that is really valuable to both faculty and students. This concludes part one of our conversation. To hear part two, be sure to subscribe to Digication Scholars Conversations on YouTube, iTunes, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. Digication Scholars Conversations is brought to you by Digication, a technology platform powering the most innovative ePortfolio programs in K-12 and higher education. Our website can be found at digication.com. If you enjoyed today's conversation, please like, subscribe, and share with a friend. Thanks for tuning in.